All right, I think we can start. Fotini, over to you. Hello, welcome to our another Beyond the Series episode. Today, our journey takes us to Portugal. We are here to discuss the current situation with our comrades, as, as, uh, as, as well as the reinforcing of our movement. Be before I give the floor to Yanis for a short five to six minute, minute introduction, let's go through a few basic rules for our discussion. So each one has about three minutes for his or her intervention. However, I, I, I won't be that strict. And uh, you can ask for the floor or by, either by using the raise hand function you can find in the participant section or by just writing stack on the, on the chat. We will try as well to keep the one woman, one man rule as we usually do as, as much as we can. And now without any further delay, Yanis, you are on for, for your introduction. Thank you for the need. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Eric. Um, comrades, um, it's um, a great pleasure to um, have yet another one of these uh, uh, teleconferences where um, Diem uh, breaks the quarantine, um, violates it um, in spirit, not in person, by visiting different uh, uh, realms of um, this Europe of ours, this Europe which is uh, um, sort of proving the presence of um, the Diem Manifesto in February 2016. Back then we said that um, Europe uh, either will be democratized or will, it will disintegrate. It is clear that it failed to democratize itself. We failed to democratize it and now it is disintegrating. Portugal is uh, a country that's very close to my heart because uh, I remember very vividly uh, your Carnation's Revolution. Um, I remember Otelo de Carvalho and all the other comrades that um, overthrew a dictatorship of many, many decades uh, and actually started the process of decolonization of parts of Africa. Um, and, um, you know, a process which, of course, was um, um, ended by that, I think, is something that we need to remember and to inform the new generations in Europe, it was ended by the Social Democrats. It was the German Social Democrats together with the Portuguese Social Democrats that ended the Carnation's Revolution and created um, a new establishment that uh, led inexorably to the authoritarianism that your country and our country and other countries experienced in 2010 with the Euro crisis. It was, um, let me remind those who, or who, 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 who know it and tell those who didn't know, that it was um, Helmut Schmidt that took a very active role in crushing the progressives in Portugal in the 1974, 1975, 1976 period. Uh, it was again the Social Democrats that um, introduced the notion of a debt break in Germany. And it was Steinbrück. Uh, not Schäuble, who embarked upon massive austerity across Europe. Uh, I say this because with the um, disintegration that we are now experiencing across Europe, there are two sirens that need to be silenced. The DiEM25 must take a very active role in silencing. One is the siren that calls upon the countries of the sort of South to unite together and to break off from the rest of the European Union. The idea that, you know, we tried out the EU, it's not working. Um, you know, the Germans and the Dutch and the whatever, the Finns um, are not interested in solidarity across Europe. Uh, let's create uh, a union of the South, Portugal, Spain, Greece, Italy, and so on and so forth. That is a siren that we must strangle at birth. Because you know the whole point about the M25 is that there is no such thing as the North and the South, the Germans and the Greeks, the Dutch and the Portuguese. This is a fight between progressives everywhere against regressives everywhere. So that's the one siren that has been um, vociferous. We, her, it is a her. Her voice uh, is increasingly loud, and it must. We must drown it. The second siren is a siren that 
well, things are so bad, we need to reach out to the soft left, to the center, to the social democrats in uh, Germany, to the PD in Italy, to the PSOE in, in, in Spain and so on. Uh, you know, the traditional bastions of social democracy. Um, that's my personal view that <laughs> if we were to do that, we would simply annul the existence of DiEM25. And the reason is that um, the crisis uh, was engineered by a coalition of Christian Democrats and Social Democrats. The crisis would never have gotten so bad, and its, um, its um, um, handling would not have been so catastrophic had it not been for this unholy alliance between Social Democrats and uh, the right. Uh, there are definitely very good people who are still caught up in the mesh of social democratic parties, whether it's SPD in Germany or um, the, you know, the Socialist Party in Portugal. Uh, there, are still, uh, there are many good people there. We need to liberate them. The last thing we need to do is to have an electoral alliance with them in any shape or form which simply would reproduce the capacity of social democrats uh, to destroy popular movements, whether that was the Carnation's revolution in Lisbon back in the 70s, or uh, the attempt to fight against austerity um, across the European Union. Let us not forget that um, the president of the Eurogroup today is a Portuguese minister of finance uh, who was put there by an alliance of the socialists on the left, including the communists, Mr. Centeno. Mr. Centeno is um, the epitome, the best example of how disgraceful social democracy is. Because all he did was to legitimize the illegitimate, having followed on the footsteps of Jeroen Dijsselbloem, the, another social democrat. Let me remind you, Dijsselbloem was also the representative of the Dutch Social Democratic Party, in whose name he played the role of the executioner of progressive politics across Europe. And Centeno is just following up on that tradition. Yeah, from one socialist, in inverted commas, Dijsselbloem, to another socialist, Centeno. Um, now, there's no doubt that the Costa government in Portugal is much better than the previous one. There's no doubt about that. We are not, you know, we are not steamrolling over differences and we are not pretending that there are no differences. There is no doubt that, for instance, in Greece, uh, the Syriza government was better than the current New Democracy government um, in terms of the degree of toxicity, xenophobia, and um, um, outright uh, hatred of what's decent. There's no doubt about that. I mean, anthropologically, uh, you know, the, 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 the government you now have in, 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 in Portugal is infinitely better than the government that they replaced. Similarly, the one we have now is even infinitely worse than the one. But in the end, what really matters uh, is the legitimization of illegitimate policies. In the end, um, what the socialist government in, in Portugal did was to um, do a, a deal with um, the powers that be in Europe. The powers that be in Europe, not with Europe. Do a power with Angela Merkel and uh, Schäuble. There was a clear deal that cost them. Um, after the Greek people were crushed in uh, July 2015, um, the image of Angela Merkel suffered quite a bit, and she didn't want to do the same thing with the Portuguese. So the deal was, you are going to continue implementing the previous austerity package. We are not going to impose new austerity upon you, unlike the Greek government, where they wanted to impose new austerity. And what you're going to do is you're going to lead the reproduction of the old austerity policies across Europe through your own finance minister. Now, that is a huge blow at progressive forces across Europe. Because when a social democratic, socialist, left-leaning government, whether it is the one with Mr. Centeno as the, in the finance minister or Tsipras in, in Greece, or some kind of government in Germany that may be coming in, in involving the Greens, let's say, you know, a black-green 
alliance, which is not um, um, you know, beyond our imagination. What th these infusions of so-called anti-establishment ministers in the government does, as long as there is no anti-establishment policy, what it does, it legitimizes uh, the TINA doctrine, the Euro-TINA doctrine. The doctrine that there is no alternative in this Europe and there is no greater threat for Europe than Eurotina. Because once people believe that, then the only alternative to the process of discontent is the nationalist international. They are falling prey to the national, na nationalist international. So the question is what do we do as the M25? Uh, we have to do better in terms of organization. Uh, we need to become a mass movement. For me, everything else is irrelevant. Everything else is irrelevant. Um, I don't know about you folks, but I don't want to be part of a think tank. I do not want to bar be part of a society of friends. I want to be friends with everyone and to be with everyone, but I'm not interested in, in being part of a move movement that actually um, is inward looking and which is not capable of going out there and doing two things. Firstly, explaining to people what's going on. And secondly, eliciting their support, their participation, not so much support, participation in trying to change things along the lines of a common transnational organization working on, on the basis of a common transnational Green New Deal for Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Yanis. And now let's go to Patricia. Thank you. Um, my name is Patricia. I'm from the north of Portugal, from Porto. Um, I'm going to complement a little bit of the introduction made by Yanis. Uh, we also prepared a little bit to, to show the, the political context in Portugal. Um, so, uh, the M25 in Portugal started in April 2016, uh, first with Oeiras and then with DSC from Porto. Uh, the growth of the M25 in Portugal took place in a similar way to other countries with the mobilization of people through online communications, through the promotion of local debates and through participation in demonstrations by citizens and organizations. In 2019, there was a, a, an European Spring Alliance with the Party Livre uh, for the European Parliament elections. After this period, this alliance with Livre naturally ceased. And regarding the political spectrum in Portugal, at the beginning of the M25, Portugal was still plunged into a deep austerity, as mentioned by, by Yanis. In the national elections of the late 2015, the first agreement between the left parties was signed, uh, namely the Social Party, the Left Bloc, the Communists and the Greens. It was an important milestone named Geringonza. It was a uh, name used for a machine with a fragile structure, uh, but from then on the term gained a positive connotation since Geringonza worked together after all. Although the governing, the governing party is an establishment party, uh, since 2015, anti-austerity policies have been gradually adopted, uh, giving part of hope back to the Portuguese population. Last year, in the national elections, the left remained ahead in the electoral results. However, the government is still not answering the needs of people, and there was a clear search for alternative solutions by the Portuguese. As a result, we have three new parties with, parties with a parliamentary seat, two on the right, one of the extreme right, and one of the left, Joacim, who used to be part of LIVRE, the former partner in our partner in the European Spring. Globally, after elections, we had 10 parties in our national parliament, six from the left and four from the right. At this moment, we are witnessing a growing popularity uh, of both the government and its main opponent from the central right, uh, due to the response and collaboration show in the face of the pandemic uh, COVID-19. Worryingly, the polls indicate that the extreme right party is now in the fifth place of the intention to vote. So we, we are experiencing a similar, uh, similar context to the rest of, uh, of the countries in, in Europe. 
Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. So, uh, it was uh, Patricia. After, uh, who wants to go after Patricia? Let me check the chat. Okay, Marco, do you want to go next? Or Eric, anything you would like to add? Um, I, I had a, a, a start though, since there's nobody else that wants the floor currently, very briefly, Yanis largely covered me, but I think it's incredibly important, this also sociological side effect of Tina, which is that people are driven away from politics, right? Where politics is seen as a game and where everything just sort of tends towards the center, where it's, your electoral choice is essentially what color tie the enactor of austerity will wear. Will it be a blue tie, will it be a red tie? But that's really the range of your choices. And of course, people give up on politics altogether. And that is really the kind of environment in which the far right uh, flourishes, uh, because the far right is an uh, anti-systemic force in many ways, right? So they're telling you this current system is not working, something that people of all political persuasions can agree on, right? And they're telling you, so, you know, never mind this system. Let's get rid of it. Let's do something else. You know, we will represent you in a way that they never did. And this kind of narrative in a political environment where sort of principles and values don't really mean much uh, is, is very, very powerful. And that is the, the result, not of the right, but of social democrats. That's the failure of the social democratic wing of politics um, with their very close association to neoliberalism. You know, they've created this monster that is now destroying them. You know, social democrats everywhere in Europe are tending towards irrelevancy. Um, and th there is really a sort of historic duty here for progressives, and especially for movements like DiEM25, which is made up by a lot of people who are seeing through DiEM a way to express themselves politically in an alternative way, right? Not through parties, which they are totally fed up with. Um, this, this sort of tendency to find alternative ways to express themselves uh, politically, because uh, although the electoral arena is no longer seen for many people as the space through which to fight for different political, um, to conduct political struggles, uh, that doesn't mean that people are any less political, right? That is the wrong conclusion to come to. People are still very much political. The question is, how do you harness this in an age where people have given up on traditional politics, if you like? And that is why it's so important to maintain a very strong movement in the M25. And it's also very important that when we do engage in electoral politics through our, you know, electoral wings, that we do so in a way that is totally different to anybody else right now. Uh, so this foundational document of not just another political party, that is of paramount importance, you know, and if we don't stay true to this concept of doing politics differently, then we're only adding to the already existing problem, right? And by thinking that we'll just create a party that will be better than everybody else. It's not just about that. It's about creating a party that can reinvigorate people's belief in politics. Um, and, and that's something that doesn't currently exist in most places in Europe. I would argue in no place in Europe does this alternative exist other than in places where we're trying to build it. So it's not just a project that empowers Diem. I think it's a project that is very, very important for the future of democracy in Europe. And DiEM is in a unique position to, 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 to pursue this project of rethinking electoral politics. So I, I think we should, this is a really important point that Yanis touched upon and I just wanted to, to, to underscore a little. Thank you, Eric. And let's not forget that after the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we have an extra challenge ahead of us because it's, people will tend more to be withdrawn into their own problems. And let's go to Diogo. Diogo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention was to associate uh, what Eddie just said. It's not only that politics are seen as a bad light. Politics actually now is a slang. It's like a demeaning, a demeaning term for anything. Like we can talk about anything on the street with anybody and hey, it's politics, leave it for the politicians. I don't know how, which turns we took. That actually has such a negative connotation. Like it's some sort of boogeyman or something that we cannot discuss or something that is only for the enlightened ones. There is, there is the same thing in politics there is in science, which is that 
everybody has their own field in a way because the kind of complexities and the kind of laws that we have and the kind of societal patterns that we have are so complex that it's really hard to have a grasp a holistic view of everything right and that's one of the most complicated things like you know are not you don't have to know everything about everything. That was one of the things that we realized in the Green New Deal campaign, which is everybody everybody has uh, everybody has specific areas that they are good on and they are informed on. And those we should discuss. We should have the experts on every area, be able to comment, be able to come in, interact and be able to exchange ideas. It's one of the best things we can do. And DM is a really good representation of that and I've never found it otherwise. Um, I think we'll, it's good that we can approach uh, my topic, which is the COVID since Fatini 40, actually just mentioned it. Um, so right now we have, uh, there's two things I wanted to mention about the post-COVID uh, health situation. One of them is that Portugal somehow, if this government managed to do a not so bad of a job, um, Portugal and Czech Republic right now were the first to implement uh, uh, COVID mitigation, um, COVID mitigation um, solutions. One of them is that, for example, Portugal compared to Spain, we have like 111 deaths per, per 1 million compared to Spain that has like five times more, like countries really closely associated politically, uh, uh, affiliated as well, and somehow we managed to do a better job than uh, than Spain. Uh, even the rest of Europe has 400 to 500 um, cases, uh, deaths per million. Uh, COVID somehow has uh, the resource allocation has definitely caused massive delays uh, in medical appointments, medical surgeries throughout the board. Like people that were supposed to have, for example, biopsies to 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 healthy lungs, to benign lungs, right? Lumps, I mean, um, those people. Um, kind of uh, just didn't show up to the hospital. People who have uh, hypertension uh, appointments, they, they are not going to the hospital. They are both scared of being affected by COVID and at the same time just stop going. They, they are, we, our hospitals have taken measures to actually prevent such things from happening. Like uh, the problem is our waiting list just grew and grew and grew. Like the, we already get some from some, uh, some areas in Portugal uh, from general surgery to orthopedic surgery that are already in waiting lists. And right now they are, some of them tripled. So people are actually gonna be waiting for the next two, three years. Um, most of the solutions that we that we have presented in, in DM are usually Europe-wide. Like there's a, obviously some specific problems in specific countries that do need uh, pinpoint surgical uh, solutions but most of the times we do try to present them in european sense and one of the things that um, uh, one of the things that we have to do or possibly can do is to try to implement like we were going for a european constitution we're going for a, a green new deal european green new deal for all europe why not go for a european health system i mean the, the, we could we could have countries support each other. We could have neighboring countries that, for example, passed over the peak. Like I think we all know that there is a graph and the, the way that it peaks, and we're trying to to flatten it so all hospitals can can provide the proper healthcare to people in need, especially in intensive care units. Uh, could we somehow use countries that are already past the peak and are already stabilized and are already solving other problems besides COVID? Could we help each other? Um, in a sense, to 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 prevent other to prevent other countries from going under. Like in Italy, we did a really poor job of helping out. We also didn't know, so there was there was a boogie bed at that time because we really didn't know how to approach it, and we didn't know this virus would behave virus. But the thing is, we didn't do anything for Italy. Um, our hospital staffs and our uh, our hospital support staffs and our hospitals themselves are pretty much like in dire needs right now, and. All, all mortalities are actually increasing. Like we're talking about a lot of COVID. Like I don't know if you ever turned on the television, but like every single news channel in Portugal is always talking about COVID. But our deaths for even for other diseases, other respiratory diseases, other bacterial infection, cardiological cardiology problems, those have definitely a reason. And I think we can go for a small exchange here, and then I will take it if necessary. What can we do? Thank you, dear. Thank you, dear. Oh, it seems that unfortunately that uh, COVID-19 is here to stay and we'll have to manage to live with it for quite some time. So, Yannis and Simona, let me allow Simona to go first for our gender balance and then Yannis. Simona. I, I was not prepared. Um, <laughs> hi, Diogo. It's, I'm so happy to meet you again. Um, yes, we are totally in for a European health system. And uh, uh, this crisis uh, showed uh, uh, all the problem, issues with the uh, uh, national um, health systems and uh, as above all about uh, privat privatization. Uh, think that uh, in this moment in Italy, uh, Lombardy and uh, Emilia Romagna are uh, uh, two of the most heightened 
uh, regions by this virus. Um, regional governments are, uh, and this is, there is no difference uh, uh, between uh, uh, Lombardy League, League uh, half fascist uh, government and uh, uh, Emilia Romagna uh, social democratic uh, government. They are uh, allowing private uh, um, uh, facilities to uh, test uh, people uh, who uh, pays to be tested. Now, this is in enormous uh, uh, health, uh, um, the health of the whole community requires uh, everybody that can be tested to be tested to stop the epidemic, epidemics. And the idea of having people pay to be tested instead of be paid to be tested is absurd. And this is a, an, an example of how uh, public health is a, a need for everyone and how of our privatization uh, is destroying us and is uh, at the root of this crisis. And um, the other reason for an European system, health system, is that uh, if we had uh, uh, faced this crisis together since the beginning, uh, without uh, competing for uh, buying masks, for example, uh, we would uh, have uh, uh, had maybe no crisis. It would have been stopped, been stopped uh, very in a very quick time, maybe. Uh, but this was definitely one of the reasons of the spreading of the COVID. So uh, we are totally in uh, uh, for a, for the fight for a European health system. We discussed it in uh, all the other Beyond the Balcony meetings. Uh, let's, uh, let's fight for this uh, together. Thank you very much, Simona. Yanis, back to you. I just wanted to ask a few questions. Um, I've already said what I wanted to say. Uh, of our Portuguese comrades, uh, firstly, um, thank you so much, uh, Patricia, for the update, the you know uh, overall overview of what uh, Team Portugal has been doing. What I would like to hear from you is, firstly, looking back, what do you think about our alliance with Livre? Um, what do you think we should be doing now in terms of um, Livre, in terms of other movements, other parties? And how can DiEM25 identify particular campaigns in Portugal? Could be small scale campaigns in some town or broader campaigns that uh, we target. That concerns Portugal. This, I'd like to hear each one of you uh, respond to that. Uh, the second question concerns um, DiEM's overall approach. Uh, how can DiEM25 Portugal uh, participate and what can it, you contribute to the direction that we must take from now on? We already have made some, um, uh, you know, uh, COVID-19 has um, forced us, and that's not a bad thing, to be more radical uh, regarding, for instance, uh, the three-point plan uh, on uh, uh, what the European Central Bank should be doing, the Green New Deal, and so on. Um, I hope, yeah, I'm sure you, you know of that three-point plan. And post-capitalism. So these two questions. What is your assessment of our strategy in Poland last May with Livre? What we should be doing now? What campaigns we should be targeting in Portugal? Uh, you know, do we want an electoral wing in Portugal? Or do we want to do what we did last time, which is to find a party like Livre and support it, turn it into our electoral wing, and more generally, your contribution on DMs regarding DMs over broader strategy? Thank you very much, Yanis. Then we go to David. David. 
Just very briefly, because I actually, uh, what Yanis just asked is precisely what I also wanted to ask uh, of our Portuguese comrades. So I'm very keen to listen to what you all have to say. I just wanted to a little a side note from the introduction. Uh, as you all know, as Walter Benjamin once said, behind the rise of fascism, there's always a failed revolution, right? And in Portugal, there was always this thought that the far right simply would not gain ground, right? For years and years, I was listening to this idea that, oh no, it's impossible, the far right will never take ground in Portugal. And now you see what's going on there. So the fact that, and also on the other side, the fact that Portugal is being seen as a kind of pinnacle of political achievement by progressives outside of Portugal is kind of, it makes me want to lose the will to live, to be honest, because if it was the pinnacle of political achievement, then the M25 would need to exist and we would just you know, dissipate and do something else with our time. So I think the fact that uh, it isn't like that and what Yanis said at the beginning, that we need to develop a mass movement uh, is incredibly important. And I'm curious to hear uh, some of your answers to what Yanis just asked just now uh, about uh, you know, how to go ahead, etc. Uh, so I'll pass it over to you. Thanks. Thank you very much, David. And now we go to Marta. Marta? Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'll keep this very short. As, uh, as was mentioned, Portugal never decided to form an electoral wing. And I personally prefer, uh, prefer this approach to have uh, to find uh, parties, for, for example, that would want to support um, our policies and push them through instead of forming the electoral wing per se. Um, uh, as going forward, I don't know, I would, uh, again, uh, like, I like this approach. If Libre would like to uh, support, Libre or any other party would like to support any of our policies, they could continue to do so. And uh, because there was always this idea of us being uh, a force that unites the left, right? Um, as for other movements, I think the Lisbon DSC has actually been doing quite a lot of work in this. They're joining other fights that relate, for example, to um, renting and because this is obviously a big crisis right now. It has been for a while, right? Uh, living conditions and it is expected to worsen now, unfortunately. Um, and that's all, that's all I really wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marta. Back to Diogo. Diogo? Uh, yes, uh, I'll just got to say to Simona and then I'll address uh, Yanis that, for example, not forget that for in, in 2016, for in every 10 euros that we spent in healthcare was we were going to private uh, hospitals. That's something to keep in mind if we ever try to think about something uh, in privatization and how hospitals work here. Regarding Mr. Yanis's comment, um, uh, I do agree, I do believe that having somebody as him representing us, thank you, sir, uh, representing us in countries as Greece, it gives not only the, the electoral party or the electoral wings, but the M itself and the movement, it gives a really good voice, not only because your Martin rhetorics is genetically great compared to most population, but we kind of lack that figure in Portugal. For example, one of the things that Ruta Virus did, and Ruta Virus is quite a knowledgeable man as well, and one of the things that he did it was give us visibility to some of the things that we do in the, in the back lines. Like one of the things that we always have in Green New Deal discussions or in NC discussions is that we don't sometimes have the way to pass the message forward. Like, of course, we can try to engage with the, with some of the with some of the media out there, we can or, or associate with organizations, and we have been trying to do that not only in Lisbon, also in Porto, and special for smaller sized campaigns. Um, but for example, the Green New Deal like, comes out of mind, for example, the, the Association of Extinction Rebellion uh, in addressing the public assemblies uh, by, in Porto, or uh, you, we have a lot of potential partnerships uh, to, around here that we can do for specific DM campaigns. But I think is DM itself associated, associating with any political party, it needs to come from the higher structure it needs to come from the CC. It needs to be something that the CC can reach out and should reach out to. It cannot be like a Portuguese NC cannot just address Livre. I mean, we can contact uh, Mr. Rutavares or anybody inside Livre. Uh, I think that's the one we have most potential with associating and are like-minded to, to DM um, compared to the other Portuguese left-wing parties. Uh, not that the others would not support part of the ideas, but they have been around for way too long and their history kind of sometimes entangles them from actually creating more history or making more history. And Livre is definitely something that we can keep in mind and we should keep in mind because Mr. Rutavares is a black person in Portugal. He's a, a like-minded 
individual to us and definitely would be on board with most of the with most of our proposals not, not mainly the green deal itself and the thing is that that right now they they're trying to do something with the portuguese government with the pacto verde the green pact which is it tackles some of the measures of the Green New Deal, but it's in no way the same scope, in no way the same objectives, and in no way the same solutions that we have been proposing uh, with the Green New Deal. And that's something that we should definitely address. We should get them on the same page. If the, the Portuguese government is going to have for the next two years uh, the Green New Deal as a banner, especially for the leadership of the European uh, uh, Parliament, we should definitely have proper goals and clear straight objectives. It should not be like, oh, we're going to close two power plants in the next, oh, we're going to close up six months earlier than we were expecting. That's not an objective. That's, that's a good landmark, but that's not a proper objective. And we need to be clear what our objectives are. And if we're going to establish a partnership with Livre, being intellectually, being in ideas, being in the, grabbing a few of our uh, principles or a few of our campaigns, we need to make clear what that, what those are and we need to have a clear straight line to them. Thank you, Diogo. Diogo, we go to Patricia. Thank you. Um, I was, um, I, I want to answer some of the questions. Um, um yeah it's made uh the first uh, it has to be with the alliance in, with Libre in the in the um, in the european spring um it was um, Libre was the, we had many members of Libre since the beginning of the m25 we have uh, similar ideas so it was uh, the natural uh, choice to be with Libre in in, uh, in that elections but uh, uh, we had some um, consequences also uh, namely in Porto, because uh, we had we have many members from different uh, left parties, and when we did this alliance, we lost uh, um, a very a very amount of members. Um, although we explained we have a, we have a movement and we have the, the electoral wing or a party who support our project, um, that happened. So um, I, I, I'm not. Um, Thinking as Marta and Diogo, although well, we like um, we like the ideas of Liv, um, I think uh, it would be great if we, we would have uh, enough members to constitute an electoral wing and to represent us fully. Um, so that's that's the, the alliances about about the campaigns and local campaigns. Mark already talked that uh, in Lisbon they are doing a, a very nice campaign about habitation and rights and um, and um, and tourism would also would also be a good campaign uh, and and that's it thank you thank you very much patricia before we go to where it just a quick thought i was having thing uh, uh, listening to all of you and Yanis's uh, intervention and questions it's a question I keep having these uh, all these months. How we would find a way to localize the international and the inter internationalize the local? Meaning, how we could um, uh, create local campaigns that would answer problems that are pan European or even international, and how we could bring to the, the pan European floor uh, local, local issues. Just, just a quick thought. And now we go back to Eric. Eric, the floor is yours. Cheers. I, I'll be brief because I think it's much more important to hear what your, your responses to Yanis's questions. That's the whole thing. Um, I really like what Patricia had to say. I, I agree with it wholeheartedly. And just because I know these things need to be clarified when they come up to ensure we don't have any misunderstandings also for with the people that watch this. Um, we do not decide whether or not we have a national collective, right? It's part of the way DM functions. We have national collectives where we have the capacity to create them. Uh, they get formed. In countries where we don't have them, that's not because we decided not to have them. It's because we don't have enough organized membership there to form one. The same goes for electoral wings. Electoral wings are part of the way that DM25 functions everywhere. An electoral wing is not a party that immediately participates in elections. It is the branch of the movement that evaluates the electoral situation in any given country and proposes electoral action to the movement. That's what the electoral wing is, right? It's people who are empowered specifically with that mandate. Um, the fact that we don't have it in Portugal is not because we decided not to have it. It's because there hasn't been enough interest from the membership so far. Um, but if the interest, the, the interest arose, there's nothing we can do to stop that. It, it's part of the way that DM functions, right? 
um, it's that's important to to clarify. Um, having said that, having it doesn't equate running in elections as the right. It's two different things. Uh, now, very briefly on uniting the left, what that means in my head, uniting the left means uniting the people of the left to understand uniting the left as a a project or as a mission to unite the institutions that represent the left is a dead end because institutions that represent the left have an entrenched interest in never being united there is a reason why the left is not united it is because each one of those groups depends on this unity to continue its existence it is it, there is a reason why the party of the left and the greens and the liberals and and all the different parties within the left do not come together and that is because they need to remain separate in order to continue representing the interests that they represent to continue giving jobs to the people that they give jobs and so on and so forth for me as a political amateur if you like that was one of the painful realizations through the DM project that the, the left is not united because the left doesn't want to be united at the institutional level. Our job is to create a political project, to create a political program that unites the people behind those institutions, that brings to us, to our movement, to what we're trying to do, citizens, people who are disappointed by those institutions, people who don't feel fully represented by those institutions. That doesn't mean necessarily to weaken them. It just means to create a political space where people of the left can come together, you know? And then what that translates into electorally, that's a separate question. But that is what I think should we should mean when we say uniting the left, not trying to create some kind of space whereby we'll be the glue to bring together people who don't really want to work together. I think that is a fool's errand. Um, so that that's my, my one feedback from a very frustrating, also personal experience of trying to unite the left in this understanding. Um, thank you, Fotini, and sorry if I went a bit over. Thank you, Eric. So um, let's go to, to, to Raquel and then Gonzalo and then Patricia. Raquel. Okay. Let's go to Gonzalo because it seems that we have a, some pro. Oh, no. Raquel, Raquel can, can you hear us? Because yes. I don't hear you. Um, okay. okay. Um, I, I would like to give my turn to uh, whomever would uh, like to reply to Eric, because that's not what I uh, what I want to do. So uh, does someone want to reply to Eric? So I'll give my turn to Tavid, because I only want to uh, reply to uh, Yanis. Okay. So, uh, Patricia? Do you want to do you want to answer to Eric? Well, um, I would um, I would introduce introduce uh, the next um, theme we prepared. Uh, it it is aligned with what TM or with what Eric told, and it's about the politics for all. Uh, it goes um, and then if if Raquel wants, uh, a return to to the Yanis questions. Is that okay? So, um, I have some questions here uh, that we that we were preparing uh, for this meeting, uh, thinking about TM as a whole. So, the challenge in growing in number and in meaning is massive for our movement, and therefore we must guarantee that we focus on politics made for people and not manipulated by so many artifacts that, per that permanently interfere in our political agenda. Many of the people we speak with uh, identify themselves as not being political, as not knowing how to speak or to do politics, uh, showing an insecurity with which a good part of us identify ourselves, especially in the first steps within the M25. Recognizing that we also don't know it all, and it's by sharing that we grow, is a way to empower and to connect people. Assuming vulnerability has a power puts us in an equal and integrative and in a collaborative position. It is also in this attitude that today we are all here 
exposed and willing to debate the future. And for this reason, the M25 already makes a difference and should continue this path. The question is, how can we humanize more our movement? How can we grow in scope and in significance for people without losing ourselves in the production of long scientific documents and political proposals? Another thing is trust. A greatest asset of this movement was to bring together people with common values, however, from different social backgrounds. We found that many of the members who incorporated the Portuguese movement were people who stopped believing in the old way of doing politics, stopped believing in political parties, but at the same time, they wanted to do something to change the current context. People feel powerless in the face of the political game taking place in Brussels. Unlike the national level, which many feel responsible for choosing who decides in our behalf, at the European level, who feels responsible that we are, who feels that we are represented in those groups of decision makers? And looking in both ways, who feels responsible for the European Union? Promo promoting a sense of trust in people so that they are willing to act is essential. So how to help people believe again? And last, communicating the analysis of complex transnational problems in a clear, reliable, and simple way is an extreme but essential challenge for our movement. We, the M25, were born in and grew up in the digital environment. We have the other the other value of communicating quickly, but at the same time, we are overwhelmed by the amount and speed of the information flow often with the additional difficulty of not being done in our mother language. Also, the M25 is made up of volunteer members, in which the M25 is a small part of the immense universe of their daily life. So how do we optimize the time dedicated to the M so that is worthwhile and in order to integrate relevant information in the shortest time and in an inclusive way? So uh, three big questions. Uh, I think it's aligned with the, with the, what Yarek uh, was telling about incorporating everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. Let's go to Raquel now. I was just wanting to answer to uh, Yanis, uh, what campaign should we target uh, here in Portugal? We, we speak, we speak, but we write nothing at all. So uh, uh, I think uh, a very important campaign is campaigning for uh, people to participate. Uh, Fotini asked uh, what could local action, which local actions to, could turn into international actions. Uh, I don't know, but uh, this might be also an international uh, thing uh, that we, we don't participate. We have, we, democracy is just uh, from, I don't know, three and three years or four and four years or something. It, and it, it shouldn't be, it should be daily. Thank you, Raquel. Let's go to Gonzalo. Gonzalo, you're up. Uh, yes, uh, hello, Votini. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Gonzalo from the M25. Uh, so I've heard comments uh, regarding the pandemic crisis and uh, austerity. So uh, giving a brief uh, description of what happened lately. So as we know, uh, the pandemic has forced uh, capitalism to halt the economies uh, around the world and Europe is no exception. So to face this threat, the Eurogroup uh, has approved in April of 500 billion uh, euros in loans as a solution to this economic crisis provoked by the pandemic, uh, which unfortunately is a is non-solution. The crippled economies of the South that have already been crushed uh, by years of austerity have very little economic means to face the recession that approaches. So the nine countries, included Portugal, that offer the solution for the Corona bonds, ask for this in order to restructure the debt and soften the blow of this economic problem. So this will not no longer happen. And the gap between the European North and South will widen as the governments fail in their assessment to attempt to provide well the same remedy that was given in the 2008 crisis. 
So the most powerful countries, the frugal four, so Germany, Holland, Austria, and Finland, will try during next year to apply the fiscal consolidation to all countries that benefit from this loan. So what will happen is that the countries are already indebted, they will uh, go over budget, and which will result in further austerity. So the pandemic comes and makes everything worse than it was. So uh, in this, this maelstorm of information, uh, our finance minister and president of Eurogroup, Mario Centin, uh, is uh, at least in the news, played a very important role, saying that we needed the Marshall Plan and uh, we needed to, to implement euro bonds. But coming uh, the decision and the news, we think that he has gone uh, more to the frugal side of things, shall we say. So uh, the bill of austerity is fast approaching. So next year, European citizens will be asked to pony up the cash. So the end of, uh, of the Eurozone is incredibly near and perhaps even the Euro itself, the EU itself. So uh, which will, with this increased friction on the North side, North being more wealthier, capable of dealing with these blows more efficiently in the South, not so much. Uh, a split will probably occur along those lines and then further disintegration will follow. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much, Gonzalo. And now we're to, we return to Simona. Uh, I wanted to uh, make a note about uh, uh, how to stop doing the old politics. Um, to stop doing old politics is uh, what we are in for. And uh, we started by saying uh, uh, the receipt will come because uh, uh, we have no rece receipt for it. Um, let's never forget how difficult it is. And uh, let's never forget that um, every, everyone uh, falls uh, continuously in old habits and old ways to do politics. And uh, because this is the frame through which we uh, approach reality. Um, we are the way we are accustomed to uh, to see how uh, politics is done uh, continuously, continuously surface up. Um, as an example, uh, and for us and for uh, others. Uh, when you say we'll make a, a new kind of party, uh, the electoral wings uh, that are uh, wings that are an European party with wings with branches, um, people don't don't understand it, and we don't uh, often too often we don't understand it. Uh, we uh, talk about uh, a European um, electoral wings but we uh, think about uh, uh, old fashioned parties. Uh, so about it, never forget how difficult it is. And uh, uh, let's strive for horizontality. Um, we, an, another uh, old way to make politics is the hierarchical uh, way, the patriarchal way. And uh, uh, it is, not easy at all uh, to um, create a new way, non-patriarchal, non-hierarchical, and horizontal to make it. Uh, we must strive for it and uh, never forget how difficult, sorry for repeating, how difficult it is. Um, as for um, austerity, uh, this is the real uh, issue uh, next year. Uh, all Southern Europe, but all Europe shall face uh, an epidemic of uh, reforms, of austeritarian reforms that uh, shall lead to more privatization. Um, let's not forget that um, Chicago, Chicago School started by imposing to uh, debt uh, an epidemic of reforms uh, on uh, uh, third world uh, countries. And this epidemic 
uh, in health services uh, uh, left, <laughs> we call it an epidemic of reforms because it, um, it hit all uh, health systems in uh, uh, third uh, world countries uh, with uh, privatization um, and uh, austerity politics uh, started by uh, from hospitals and uh, health services uh, all over the world. And uh, uh, this is what shall happen next year if we don't uh, fight it. Thank you, Simona. Marco, the floor is yours. Thank you, Putini. Hi, everybody. I'm Marco from uh, uh, live in Lisbon currently. It's nice to see all these people awake on, on Saturday this hour. Um, I wanted to just reflect a little bit on some of the questions that were raised, um, mainly like which campaigns um, BM25 should take or could take in Portugal. Uh, well, a uh, couple of members here, Marta and uh, Patricia, for example, mentioned that uh, the collective in Lisbon did take part in one particular campaign. I would like to come back to that a little bit later. But um, I would like to also introduce a topic that is, that is related to all of these. And that has to do with uh, uh, cities, habitation, and, and the municipalism. And uh, especially habitation is a major issue in, uh, in Portugal that we should we should definitely focus on uh, with uh, with great strength. So just to give a small introduction, uh, like in like how it came to this situation, which I'm going to uh, present in Portugal, mainly in the last decades, like uh, in Portugal, focus was on constructing new buildings in cities and towns, um, which was greatly aided by the official policies towards real estate and banks easing their 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 business. So the renting offer was shrinking at a great Pace. So the much needed requalification of cities and towns was was completely set aside, or at least I know uh, in in in, uh, in, um, in big uh, uh, by great deal, and uh, new construction was sim uh, prioritized. So more than uh, about uh, seven and a half thousand of eight thousand golden visas that were issued in Portugal uh, as of 2012 were exactly for uh, investment in real estate. So um, this was this was now paused for two cities for most affected which were Lisbon and Porto but uh, but it still continues in other, in, in other areas of Portugal so besides this Portugal also receives millions of tourists every year so a lot of infrastructure of cities is built around this so to, to, to bring benefits um, and this brings also benefits of, uh, of course but it's also one of the major factors that brought to the dynamics of the prices of rents and everything else uh, uh, rise continuously, making the cities practically non-livable for many locals. And this is obviously not only a Portuguese issue, but um, it, it's a very, uh, very burning one here. Um, so many, many house owners turn to Airbnb because it's simply more profitable than long-term rents. Uh, and there are few controls um, imposed, uh, and it's very difficult to actually fiscalize in Portugal. Now, of course, we recognize that the housing sector is, is obviously of a, of a paramount interest uh, for a society. When, when basic human needs, a need for a shelter is not adequately responded to, this uh, deteriorates the quality of urban life tremendously, and it provokes various conflicts and, and, and dis disequilibriums in, in society. So lack of accessible uh, housing at this point is already widely considered a social problem in Portugal. Raising prices are putting ever more uh, pressure on the most vulnerable citizens. So in, with, with COVID-19, uh, many people uh, in Portugal, as every, everywhere else, uh, lost at least part of their income um, or even their job, thus uh, finding it even more difficult to pay the rents. Um, um, and these were once again, as, uh, as, as, as many other uh, situations like offered as a solution uh, to take loans to deal with this, uh, which simply further aggra uh, aggravates uh, these people's predicament. So uh, there were some local movements and groups in, um, in Portugal uh, that very recently started a campaign um, the, um, that was uh, supported by the local collective of Lisbon, and that we as an NC, 
of Portugal also support. It's called uh, Casa ou Pão Não, which would translate to house or bread, no, showing that we disagree with the choice. So we, would, we need to choose between uh, uh, <clears throat> having a house or having bread. So some of the some of the um, demands that that is, that is that are presented in this campaign are for, uh, canceling rents during the Corona crisis for the people who do not have the necessary income for an adequate habitation for effort rate. Um, well, or um, stopping the banks from benefiting on more interest during the crisis, uh, not allowing creation of more debt generated by suspension of rents and credits, um, establishing finally a, a rent price stop limit in relation to the, to the income of the workers, uh, suspension of all evictions which are still happening in Portugal during the crisis, uh, if there are no guaranteed alternative solutions for adequate housing for people who are at risk. Um, then availability of abandoned buildings for habitation, uh, whether public or private. Uh, this is a major issue in Portugal because uh, Portugal is among the top countries in Europe when it comes to abandoned buildings. Buildings that are simply uh, not being used and, um, and um, are, are you know, usually in, in, in uh, locations where prices are continuously rising, skyrocketing. So just to, to give an example, for example, uh, Lisbon was only a third municipality in, in Portugal when it comes to the, the, the percentage of abandoned buildings in the city and, and it amounts uh, to, to about 7% and it's raising by, by, by a really fast rate. So um, a post COVID-19 would require even a more comprehensive answer to how we actually live cities and how do we approach the question of habitation not as a as a commodity, but but as a basic right accessible to all. So this is just one example of, of a campaign. I believe um, the N25 should uh, support the very important questions here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. It was very interesting indeed. Uh, renting is housing is increasing very pressing problem as well. Rent prices have gone up even during the pandemic, and I'm afraid the situation will deteriorate in the months to come. And now we go back to Marta. Marta, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. And uh, I apologize in advance if I'm skipping between topics, but uh, <laughs> I would actually like to piggyback on uh, the topic Pat Patricia introduced and connected to something Eric said earlier. Because I, I do agree that it is very important for our movement to be clear, vulnerable, and relatable. I think it boils down to being relatable. Because, again, the rise of the extreme right happens. I think most people that uh, fall into this uh, rhetoric uh, share a disdain for traditional politics, as Eric mentioned earlier. But I don't think this happens strictly because of the lack of credibility of institutions, but also because of the language traditional politics use and the extreme right uh, uses. Um, because again, traditional politics use a uh, very technical and intelligible language. I, and it actually seems to be directed at the, to push away people and make people feel like, uh, uh, they cannot relate or understand what's being said. And uh, on the other hand, extreme right uh, usually uses a very relatable and uh, coarse even language. And um, this is all I wanted to say. Thank you, Marta. Yanis, the floor is, is over to you. Thank you. Uh, some a, a, a couple of things I'd like to say. First, look, um, we are, unfortunately, at the beginning of an awful decade. The 1920s uh, were not a good decade. They ended in a way that ushered in the 1930s. Our 20s are going to be worse. Brace for it. Uh, you, already, and you, you, you already spoke about the way in which uh, this Eurogroup's um, determination to load gigantic amounts of debt onto countries like Portugal, France, Italy, Greece, and so on, without any debt restructuring. 
either for the states or for the individuals uh, without any uh, redistribution of uh, either property rights or wealth. That is a decision which is condemning the generation of today, especially the younger amongst you, uh, to a permanent Great Depression. There is no doubt that this is coming. And uh, like in the 1920s and 30s, the Great Depression, um, the deflationary forces, the fact that austerity is, um, as I believe Gonzalo said, um, is, is, is a given now. And you know, think about it. Incomes are falling, public debt is increasing, and def government deficit. Next year, Centeno himself, as the president of the Eurogroup, is going to impose austerity upon himself because you, know, you are going to have a, de a budget deficit of 10% uh, when you are supposed to have a, a, a primary budget surplus. Uh, the moment Berlin hits the Schwarz Null, as they say, I'm not, my, my German is terrible, the, the black zero, uh, the directive will be for the rest of us to at least not to get to zero, but to get to minus three, minus four. And from minus 10 to minus four, that's an austerity worse than in 2011. So this is coming, that's a given. And these deflationary forces will definitely create political monsters. They will breed political monsters. It's only the right, the xenophobes, the disintegrationists uh, that are going to, like, along, alongside with the bankers, uh, do reasonably well, or very well, and everybody else is, is going to suffer immensely. So, you know, there's no sense in continuing to speak as if this is 2016, 2017, 2018. We are on the verge of the cusp of an awful set of uh, conditions, uh, and our analysis, I'm afraid, remains the only pertinent one. Uh, one brief comment on uh, uh, what uh, I think Ra Ra Raquel said about the need to incite people to participate. You're completely right. But we just can't do it by asking them to participate. It, it will be an utter failure to say to people, come on guys, come on girls and boys, women and men, participate. They say, why? Go away. The only way we can make them participate is to give them a reason to participate in some particular campaign that is close to their heart, something that angers them, something that, that, that excites them, something that makes them feel strongly about it. And then they participate. Uh, participation must be a byproduct of um, a drive that we help create, which means we need to you know, think, think of, you know, of instance, you know, yesterday in the launch of the Progressive International, uh, we had that wonderful 13-year-old um, girl from Uganda, Vanessa, um, who created a whole movement in Uganda on her own, Fridays for Future kind of movement, you know, and a, a Greta moment when she decided, she heard of what Greta was doing in Europe, in Sweden and so on. So she decided to strike for the climate in Uganda. Uh, and people joined. She didn't ask them to participate. She did something. She took an action. So that's what we need to identify in Portugal, in every country. But since we're now talking about Portugal, you need to identify what we need to highlight, what we need to do so that people can participate lecturing at people that they must participate never works. This is uh, at least my, my very strong belief, and I'm sure you agree. Now, going back to the great duty of DiEM25, DiEM25 identified the crisis of Europe back in 2016, which is now escalating with a new austerity tsunami that's, that's coming. Um, and I want to now talk about, you know, politics. Uh, the language of politics and the practice of politics. Let me remind you, comrades, that when we started DiEM, uh, we didn't intend to create electoral wings or to contest elections. Our intention was exactly as Eric put it, to unite the forces of the left, the people of the left, even some party members of 
left-wing political parties and progressive parties, not just the left, but you know, even some we even talk, talked about, you know, progressive liberals and greens who don't identify themselves with the left, uh, along the lines of a program, you know, a minimum program for Europeans that would make a difference, that would um, prevent this um, slide into depression, uh, both psychological and economic, that would prevent the rise of the nationalist international, that would allow us to start thinking of a constitution of democratic Europe so that we create a European Republic. Yeah? This is what we started doing in 2016. And maybe naively, maybe not so naively, what we said is, you know, we'll spend a year, a year and a half, creating the Green New Deal for Europe, which also includes within it the constitutional assembly process for democratizing, not just shifting 5% of GDP to the green transition, not just creating a universal basic dividend, not just creating a jobs guarantee program, but also creating a, a political process. So citizens can be empowered to discuss the kind of constitution they want to live under uh, along European lines. We, we did that. And when, let me remind you, we invited lots of people to come and participate in this. And lots of people did come. We had um, representatives from Podemos, from Die Linke, from, even from Mélenchon's party, from the Communist Party of France, from Livre, of course. Um, even some members of the Bloco came along. And uh, they didn't do much work. They liked the idea of a Green New Deal for Europe, a process whereby, through consultation, through participation, would come up with one document for Europe. And they were even quite happy to say good things about it or even to put their, their names under it, right? But then, about a year and a half before the European Parliament elections, we turned, um, and Eric knows that, and Fotini knows that, because we were part of this together. We turned to these very same people, the very same people that participated in the Green New Deal for Europe, and they who were very proud of it, and they were speaking about it um, uh, in the, the, the most flattering of terms. And we said to them, okay, are you going to push this in your party? Are you going to ask your party, you know, Katya Keeping, I'll just mention names now, why not? Katya Keeping, a friend, a comrade, co-president, of the Linke, will you push this to be your party's policy for the European Parliament elections? We have a European Parliament election that's pan-European. This is a pan-European policy. You help participate. Will you push for this to be your party's policy? The answer is no, because it can't be, you know, the other factions of the party will not agree to it. So what are we going to do? Um, and, and the same thing, we had the same experience everywhere. In Spain, half of them, not half, the leadership of Podemos, most of them, even those who liked our Green New Deal, they had a policy of not having a policy on Europe. They wanted to run in the European Parliament election, say, no, 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 we're not going to say, to answer the question, you know, um, what should happen at the level of Europe, because this will alienate people who don't want to be in the European Union. What? That is why we started thinking of electoral wings. That is why we started thinking of running in certain countries on our own, like in Germany. I mean, ideally for us, we would have found, we would have had a ticket where, you know, the Linke, Greens, DMers, we'd all be together under the European Green New Deal. Not because it was our Green, Green New Deal and we, you know, felt that we owned it, we had property rights over it, but because we needed one Green New Deal for Europe across Europe. And if they wanted to change some of the things we had in there and put something else that we may not even very be, be very happy with, we were prepared to do that for the purposes of unity. That's what unity means. Unity means to have one agenda across Europe. Of course, you know, we have to compromise. And, you know, if the Polish Razum uh, comrades say, but you know what, we have lots of coal miners here, we can't say eradicate coal immediately. Okay, let's make some amendments to the, but you know what I mean. Um, but in the end, it's what Eric said, we realized it to give a damn. Even the people who had come with us from other political parties like the Linke, like the Greens, you know, the Greens, the Belgian Greens were completely enthusiastic about our Green New Deal. Um, Eric remembers we had a meeting with the head of the Belgian Greens in Paris, who was going, yes, let's get on together in the European Parliament election under that agenda. But then two days later, they changed their mind because, you know, they operate like a bureaucracy, the Greens. The Greens have to run, you know, you've got to remember they've got employees, they have salaries, they have funding, and that funding is there as the Greens. So like, like, like Goldman Sachs, like Volkswagen, they have a, a corporate logic. And our Green New Deal for Europe was getting in their way. 
you know, and in the end, in the Linke, you know, Katya and Sara run together without a common agenda because they disagreed on everything. Okay. None of them run without Green New Deal or any Green New Deal, unless it was in, you know, principles, just ideas that we need a Green New Deal as long as, as, long as we don't explain what, it, what goes in it. That's what creates um, a backlash against politics by citizens, by people. They, they, they hate, they loathe this bureaucratic tendency of politicians, or tendency, um, attitude of politicians, where they, all they care about is the reproduction of their own little shop, their little, their, their little you know, manufacturing plant. That's, that's what they do. We are not like that. Um, we took the risk of running in several countries, knowing we would lose, knowing we didn't have the money to do it, that we would be vilified by those bureaucracies of the left, more so than the right. The right didn't pay any attention to us. We were vilified by, you know, our comrades, because they saw Diem as a challenge to their tiny little fiefdoms. You know, this is a, this is, we have to realize that the worst enemy of progressives is that they have feudalism. There is a feudalist structure in the, in, 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 amongst so-called progressives, which is what Diem came into being in order to, uh, to, to counter. Um, so this is why we created our, our electoral wings. You saw Portugal is a very good example that we didn't care so much about having our own electoral wing. You know, Rui Tavares is somebody that I've worked with since 2000, the year 2000. We worked together on a Green New Deal when nobody even knew of the words Green, Green New Deal. He and I were in Parliament, European Parliament, when he was a European Member of Parliament, uh, and we were trying to create that kind of um, alliance between liberals, social democrats, communists, uh, greens, back in 2002, Rui and I, okay? So he had a party, well, fine, we support you. In Denmark, the beautiful party of the alternative, we support you. We only created the electoral wins and, and, and parties when we had no alternative, as a chore, as something we really had to do. I mean, here in Greece too, I would have so much loved it if there were other, an, an alliance people saying, let's adopt DM's agenda and run with it, then I would have supported them. I wouldn't even have run for parliament. Life would have been far better for me if I didn't run for parliament. So that is the spirit of DM25. This is what you, you must understand. And, and you know, it's not for the CC to pass assess an assessment on our alliance with Libre in May 2015. It's for you folks in Portugal to tell us what you think. You're, you're, not, you know, you're not going to make the decisions on your own, like none of us are going to make a decision. We all, all together make these decisions in all member votes, whether we're going to run with party X or party Z or create our own party in any country. But we need you on the ground to tell us, you know, how did that alliance with Livre pan out? How's Livre doing today? Are there other forces that we should consider talking to? Should we create our own party? Not that I'm proposing it, but we want the feedback. And that leads me finally to something Simona said and I'll shut up. Look, um, everything I've said is consistent with Simona's point that we're trying to do politics differently. Remember, when we decided to create um, um, electoral wings, we said not another political party. We are not creating just another political party in Austria, in Germany, in Greece, and so on. Uh, and what marks us out is this attempt to do something that has never been done before, to combine, not on paper, but in reality, in practice, horizontality with verticality. Horizontality on its own is going to create very nice feelings amongst us, but it will be impotent. It is impossible that, you know, um, every decision is on the basis of um, spontaneous uh, all-member convergence. We need to have coordination, we need to, to, to combine democratic verticality with maximum horizontality. That has never been done before. Uh, we are, it's work in progress, it will always remain work in progress, uh, but we need you to be part of this effort to integrate our Portuguese um, members into this transnational pan-European effort. Thank you. Thank you, Yanis. And now we go to the, to the audience. Thank you. Uh, 
before I address uh, the situation with Libra, I definitely wanted to make the point of Eric made before about localized politics. And I think we kind of deviated because we started talking about quite a few other things. And one of the problems that we have with localized uh, with localized politics and going over the institutions and getting to the people themselves, it's something that, for example, the Sunrise Movement has been able to effectively do. We had a couple of talks with them uh, as a Green New Deal campaign. And one of the things that we did notice is their, their different, different hubs. I wrote this, I'm not sure if anybody at the time did read it somewhere else, but they have this, this structural hubs where they have like the central hub, they have the political decision making and the think tank, and they have the street action hub and like they're all separated. People are different in themselves, but the people are obviously coordinated, right? And that's something that we don't have as, as a DM, like in DM, of course, we do have electoral wings and we talked about the importance and the meaning of those, but we we don't have this clear separation. For example, one of that's one of the things that we like in Portugal. Livre would be our electoral wing, or Livre could be some part of our electoral wing if we're not going to establish one by ourselves. Uh, regarding the solutions for the local problems, the solutions are local most of the times. So despite the, the approach can be the same as in many different European countries, that's one of the problems with the Green New Deal toolkit, right? Like we're trying to do it in Barcelona. If we could, we have a lot of Green New Dealers in Porto and we could try to um, swing or sway the people in the Porto municipal elections. That was one of the things that we could do. The problem is for to do that, we need to empower the Green New Dealers and the DMers in the area to be able to actually go to the public assemblies and to be able to, to be effective. Like having a couple of us representing there, if we're not vocal, if we're not proposing correct solutions for those problems, rather than talking about bigger European issues, and I'll get there in a second, we need them people there on the field to have the kind of argumentative rhetoric that Mr. Yanis does have. We need to, the people there to have the kind of uh, uh, thought process and to be able to extract from Europe and from the Green New Deal in Europe-wide sense and extract the solutions from there to the problems specifically in Porto, because people in Porto will have obviously different problems than people in Lisbon. That, that's one of the problems of the toolkits and the regional toolkits, but that's something that we need, definitely need to work out. Um, this can be really good for municipal elections, not only, especially because it doesn't require big numbers, like small public assemblies in municipal elections, they have like 20, 30 people discussing about one or two problems and the parties will come and give one or two suggestions to those problems or maybe just ignore them. But we could make be effective there. One or two really well-placed voices, for example, the municipal elections in Portugal are gonna be 2021. We have talked about this a, a few times in both NC calls and in both the Green New Deal calls. And we can make an effect there, but we need to have people prepared, people with rhetorics, people with good ideas, people with clear headed sight of what the pillars of Green New Deal, what the pillars of the DM are. And we need to have those people literally on the field. Well, after Corona passes. Um, Regarding what what Mr. Yanis was saying of the of the, the the European political system, like of course, thank God we actually got some European members par, members of Parliament on our side, Ms. Lalok and the. This is something that we really needed because, for example, imagine we go to a municipal election. Imagine we even try to engage with, the, for example, the people from PS or PSD in a local level. They might be on board with it, but as soon as they, we even talked about green bonds, EU green bonds, or as soon as we talk like restructuring of the parliament or the, the European Commission, which needs to happen, they are not going to go along with it. As soon as we say that Antonio Costa is going to come down with his mighty hammer and is going to turn us away from, from us. That's not going to happen. That's definitely not going to happen. That's why a political wing as such as Livre, even in the municipal level, they have a bit bigger number than us, and they, they are like-minded, as I said before. We definitely need those people to, uh, to, to be on our side, and we need to use them as they can use us, using a good sense, uh, because I think we can achieve something. Uh, something that I didn't man manage, manage to, to speak about before. Thank God we don't have gerrymandering in Portugal, but one of the things we do have, uh, the same as the uh, US, uh, we have a lot of uh, Political ads, what they call it, right? But I think it's, it should be called apolitical or depoliticizing ads because what they do nowadays, and we're talking about different parties and different spectrums of the political uh, uh, affiliations and institutions. What I'm not talking about is the the fact that they just now they they, they are trying to divest people from politics themselves. They're trying not to make us engage. That's the whole purpose of uh, Cambridge Analytica and our friend Steve Bannon. Uh, that that's to de-engage us from politics, and those are our biggest enemies. Martin extreme right in the general sense or some specific parties or extreme measures, the people who are trying to divest us from politics are the people we should be focusing on. That's why I believe Miss Raquel is uh, Steve Bannon's greatest enemy. And that's why we should uh, we should have, have the campaigns to participate all the way throughout our movement. We should get our friends, our families, even non-friends and families. That's why the, we need to have that reach out. And right now in Portugal, I don't believe we can have that kind of reach out. Um, if we don't, uh, if we don't associate ourselves with some of these campaigns and some of these, in this case, only one party, the Libra, uh, and Mr. Noam Shosky said, we'll overcome Corona crisis, but we'll have many more crises ahead of us. And we have seen how good the, the Corona bonds are coming. Imagine trying to push for green bonds with the current political parties. I cannot. Thank you, Diogo. And now back to Patricia. Patricia? 
Um, I, I, I will want to focus um, in, a, in a particular thing that Yanis was telling that we need to jump from our national level to the European uh, level. Um, and I would like to share um, my experience in 2010, 2011, and that led me to the end 25. And I think uh, the important thing that, uh, that Yanis also said, it's that people need to identify and need to be angry and to see the real effect on their daily lives that these kind of decisions make. Uh, I work in an hospital and uh, when the crisis came, um, as we all see, I, I saw in first line the consequences. So uh, we had a big amount of people uh, trying to put an end to their lives because they were ashamed, they were full of debt, and they, and, they, and they couldn't support it anymore. We had old people that stopped, that having to choose between medication and between food. Um, we also, um, I once had, um, had a boy who came smiling, um, entered the emergency room, and um, he, um, he asked to close the door, and he, tried in the, he, he cried like a baby because he couldn't afford to go to a dentist. He had a massive infection, but he couldn't lose his job because his, law, his job was a privilege. And everyone uh, thought the job was a privilege. So you, you couldn't complain. It, it, it was so dense that you con, could al almost uh, touch it, the, the, the harsh environment. So uh, if we are heading there again, we, we should tell people, no, that's not the way. So that, that's my con contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. Now back to David. David, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, first of all, I'm David. I'm uh, relatively new to the M25 compared to the rest of the, the Portuguese people here. But uh, it's, and it's a pleasure to meet you all and to, to have this conversation. So uh, I just wanted to say a bit uh, connected to many things that uh, were said here, although I'm relatively new, just to, to give a bit my opinion. And I was thinking, uh, how connected to how can we spread the, the, the ideas of the M in Portugal and get uh, Portuguese people a bit more engaged with the movement? I think connecting to issues that are, are although we are a pan-European movement, connecting to issues that are very present in the, in the lives of uh, people in Portugal is very important. I, and I think housing and the, the, this whole uh, new, new connection to, to the housing problem and all is very good. But I also think in Portugal, there are the, the independent workers, the green receipts <laughs> theme, which I think is, you have a big, big pool of like workers who are basically completely unprotected in Portugal. I was reading yesterday a bit, researching a bit about this subject because I think it's a kind of important one in Portugal and it's around 100, at least 150,000 people who have a regular hours and they don't have a contract, they don't have many rights. And it's a subject basically, although like uh, the, the, the left bloc and the communist party, they fight a bit for reform on it. I think uh, the M could capture a lot of attention if they came with a kind of more radical approach to it, like uh, to truly end it. And uh, also in Portugal, you have a, uh, there is the law issue of the, of the thing, but there is also a more executive thing because the state is actually the, the major employer of this kind of uh, precarious worker. And I think in, in Portugal, for, for the movement to grow, to get some, gain some connection to the, to the, pro the protection of the, this kind of worker would be very important. Uh, I, I also wanted to say, I think, like as was said here before, I think to go for uh, in the long term for electoral wins would be quite essential because uh, although in, in Portugal, we are lucky to have a party that uh, is very, uh, which has very similar ideas. Actually, I was uh, before the M25 was uh, attracted to Libre also because of uh, of uh, the similar project, uh, a big left wing and progressive alliance, and uh, also to have uh, to create European politics, which are kind of uh, absent in this in this current uh, current speech uh, technocratic speech where things are one way because you know they should be that way always and uh, it's not a political issue it's a technocratic issue but uh, i think in the long term uh, 
because uh, a lot of things, uh, most of the more institutionalized parties have a long history, I think as Diogo said, have a long history, it's hard, to, it's hard to change that history, they take a long time to evolve to uh, most in Portugal they are and uh, mostly in Europe I think uh, most left-wing parties are quite close to, to European politics <laughs> it's like and even those who are making a transition they make it very slow because of their history and uh, but even in the long term uh, you cannot control a bit what what will happen to to Livre you don't know Livre is also a kind of recent party so it can go still in many directions and I think to to just fully bet on this one party in the long term, I think it's not the best bet in my, in my not because of LIV, because, which I, I think it makes total sense with our current size to, to, to go with them. But I think electoral wings would be the way to go because I think the M25 has a message and it has a message that uh, at least in Portugal, in Portugal, uh, I think a lot of people who are left are waiting for this message a bit. Uh, honestly, they, they want a left-wing uh, European politics or a progressive European politics, and they don't find it, honestly, much, except on Livre a bit, but Livre has been also a bit in a controversial, in a kind of uh, hard position right now. And uh, I think uh, that's what I, a bit what I wanted to say. Yes, also about the, 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 the right-wing populism. I think we have the answer for it because I think a lot of the, this uh, nationalist uh, populism is about people are confused. Uh, they don't know really, uh, they don't understand the globalization basically. They feel scared and they turn to, the, to what's more, what is closest and more familiar to them, which is nationalism, <laughs> national politics. And I think the M uh, should, uh, should you know, as in a way the answer to that. If we can spread a message that we have a solution for uh, the, for this, if we can insist on that, I think we can can win over people. If those that are now going to for right wing populism, at least in Portugal, they can be one because they just feel scared by this big political system. They don't understand. They don't know uh, how it functions. They don't feel any control over it. So it's kind of normal that in reaction and when things are not good, people tend to go to, to old nationalism because they feel safe that <laughs> they, they are, uh, they are uh, let me see if I had any other things. Uh, and I think, yeah, and I think we should bet a lot on municipal elections to grow, to grow from a, a local level, I think. But uh, so I just wanted to give these opinions and that, okay, thank you very much. Thank you, David. And now, now we move to Raquel. Sorry. Um... Well, um, I, I, I'll pick on uh, what David uh, said about the green receipts and a little bit uh, uh, what Patricia uh, said. Um, I, I used to work uh, with, uh, I, I was one of these green uh, receipts workers and, uh, and uh, I started having less and less work. And uh, the, the, I found that the, I couldn't speak about it. I, I, it's, it's not that I couldn't speak, but people don't speak about it. Uh, everywhere, uh, people speak as if everyone had a job and everyone uh, were working. So at school, uh, the teacher says, because parents are working, because parents are working, you know, and uh, in, in, in these crises, uh, what Patricia, Patricia um, showed is that uh, people uh, are not are afraid to be vulnerable. So they have to uh, cry behind doors. And maybe we should uh, put this in the open. No. Uh, Many people, maybe most of the people, don't have uh, a job. And there are many people who do have a job, and it's a shitty job that they don't want to have, but they have to have money. So uh, maybe we should um, put this out in the open. There are many people with no jobs, and there are many people with shitty jobs that they don't want. Um, well, um, as uh, uh, I, th I think. Uh, uh, it, what Yanis said, uh, of course, is uh, 
uh, I, I agree that uh, if people don't have uh, a reason to participate, they don't participate. But uh, on the other hand, what COVID uh, made us see is that uh, things can go really bad. And if we make them, if we imagine them a little bit wor even worse, you know, with uh, uh, water shortages, uh, water contamination, uh, if we, uh, if there's a virus in the internet, uh, without being without being able to trust what you hear, uh, what you listen to on the radio, I mean, this can really get worse. So instead of wanting to gain, uh, maybe the narrative should should be not wanting to lose anymore. So this might uh, foster, uh, I don't know, might uh, promote a little change. Um, that's it. Thank you, Raquel. And before I give the floor to, uh, to David, let's keep in mind that we are approaching our last, roughly last 20 minutes of our discussion. So keep, please keep that in mind and try to bring some, um, let's try to bring the, this, the discussion to the floor, to the ground. David, the floor is yours. Thanks, Martini. I just want to say something a bit on, more, on, the, on the more practical side. Uh, I will get to that in a moment. But every time I'm in Portugal, every conversation seems to lead to DM25. So I'm always endlessly talking about DM to people. And they often go to me and say, oh, well, that, that makes sense. That sounds reasonable. Uh, but they don't necessarily know about DM. So it's, I think there's a lot of work that we need to do on the ground, and not just in Portugal, but across Europe, to really explain to people what the DM project is all about so that they can see that actually it's something that is, is, is useful and good for the country. So on, on that note, I think David mentioned the word size. And I think here size is important because we need to be able to mobilize, we need to organize, and I think we need to set up meetings, perhaps even tour the country like we did in Greece with Meta25 to bring our message of hope of an alternative for, for not just for Portugal, but for the European project as well um, with our constructive critique of our pre present predicament. So I think you know, growing our numbers is imperative. And, and then once we actually have the capacity to, to, to carry out certain campaigns, we will be able to, to reach way more people and succeed in, uh, in attracting people to our movement so that we can actually have a, um, we can just lead. We can lead, not just follow, right? I think that's an important thing to do. And it's really up to you guys on the ground, as Yannis said earlier, to do the assessment, to let us know what do you think our next steps should be and not to be? And then, of course, the CC will support you. I mean, I don't speak on behalf of the CC, obviously, but I think the CC will support you, of course, in making sure that we, we follow the path that, that we agreed collectively. So, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Thanks, David. Rosanna, the floor is yours now. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you all for being here. Um, as you might know, I'm in the CC now for a month. Um, and yeah, I'm also half Portuguese. Uh, I hope to be back in Portugal soon. Um, I just wanted to add uh, some things to the things what Diogo and Jana said um, regarding the Green New Deal. Um, I think it's, I'm not sure how it is right now in Portugal, but um, uh, in Germany, for example, um, where I live, there are local uh, Green New Deal groups who um, rewrite the whole Green New Deal to their local level. And uh, so if you um, are asking for a clear um, objectives um, to, to uh, approach your politicians, uh, this might be a great solution for you so that you have um, the Green New Deal topics on the local level, and that might also um, be helpful uh, regarding the participation of more people on the local level because they uh, feel more connected to their own city. Um, so, you, um, for example, in Germany, we have this these Green New Deal networks on the local level, and they include not only DM people, but only scientists and other people from outside, from other um, organizations. So it's just about bringing people together, work together, and maybe something great comes out of it. For example, in Hamburg, they just published their own 
local Green New Deal. Um, and what I also wanted to uh, suggest for you to, uh, for example, regarding your campaigns you're working on, um, maybe it would be uh, cool if you um, connect to other DSCs around Europe and to connect different local campaigns together, for example, regarding housing or um, maybe um, about the European health system so that you can like work together and uh, bring those local campaigns on a European level. That's just my suggestions, but I'm happy to hear from you. Thanks, Rosanna. And now we go to David. Sorry, just to say, so uh, uh, just uh, like just to reinforce a bit the idea, like uh, on the green receipts, I think the end could catch a lot of attention just to, with a radical message on it, not reforming, ending, ending the system. I mean, if you put, it's a lot of people you have in this situation and you can get, I think, a lot of attention because at least 150,000 people, it's a lot of people in Portugal to, to have a message directed to. Uh, also, I, I think in a way, uh, something we should do a lot is about the Green New Deal a bit is to uh, show it as an economic opportunity, like as a, a solution, not only to, to the, to the sust sustainability problems, the environmental issues, but also like an economic opportunity for Europe, because Europe is kind of, can, uh, can, is, is kind of not on, a, on a, is not improving properly. Uh, it's uh, it's economic. Uh, it's uh, how can I say? It's currently not on a on a economic uh, rising, and uh, I think the Green New Deal could be very important in that sense too. And that speaks more, I think, even to people. You know, although environmentalism is the most important thing, I think to get the message something closer to the people, like new jobs, good jobs, is also very important. Um, also, I have like uh, just, uh, I don't know, maybe for Yanish, if I could, uh, because I have this, this opportunity to, to ask you. Um, I have uh, just one, uh, one question, which is about the, the, the function of the BCE a bit. And uh, I was reading about the, the, the ECB, yeah. The, Europe, yeah, the ECB, exactly, sorry. <laughs> I, I was, um, uh, one of the proposals I don't seem to find in the M25 is something I read, I remember a couple of years ago, which is uh, related to a big difference between the ECB and the, and, the, and the Federal Reserve in the United States, which is the Federal Reserve basically has two main purposes that compete with each other. One to keep uh, control inflation and the other to control unemployment. And the BCE, and this, the reason for this is that the, it's very different states uh, in the, in the um, uh, all the states are very different uh, in, the, in the USA and they can be on uh, different economic cycles. So to keep to level it, you have these two competing basic principles of the central banks. And I think, wouldn't that be a perfect solution for Europe <laughs> in a way? To, to make that inflation and employment compete to, to solve a bit the, these big monetary issues where the euro uh, is inconvenient to some countries, more convenient, and to, uh, to put in there a kind of self-regulating system like the, the, the American Federal Reserve has. And also, uh, also a bit for Yanis, I'm just taking the opportunity. Uh, one thing I don't understand, since uh, I do believe the, 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 the fall of the European Union is closer than uh, most people think and it's more real. What is the intention of these big European players? Shovel and, and these, uh, these uh, what are their intentions? Are they just following electoralism? It's just that. What, uh, what do they win with the, with the destruction of the European project? It seems to me nothing. No one. No, not the Germans, not them, and they will be blamed for it. What is there, since Jan since has had a bit of contact, very direct contact with them in that, uh, 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 that most people don't have access, I would like to know his opinion. And uh, that's it for me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank okay. you very much, David. So, um, yes, and then we can go. Okay. Um, 
All right, let's um, begin with a technical question about the um, uh, mandate of the European Central Bank, which is uh, a single one, price stability, and which does not have within it the, um, the second pillar that the Fed has of uh, full employment. Uh, of course, it should have both. And maybe there should have a, be a third one, you know, green investments or, you know, the, supporting the green transition um, and social justice. But uh, we at DiEM25, when we set out our European Green New Deal program, right, uh, unlike those who say, oh, another Europe is possible and, you know, um, uh, wouldn't it be fantastic if we had um, a European Republic? You know, we agree, but the point is, what do you do tomorrow? In order to mobilize anyone to do anything, you have to answer the question, okay, if you were in government today, what would you do? And to say that we will change the charter of the constitution of the European Central Bank brings people to despair, because technically, to do this, you would need to push it through uh, 20... 27, 28, I've lost count now, um, because of Brexit, I forget, 27, 27 parliaments, maybe a referendum as well. So the moment you start saying something like that, people despair. So what we as DIM do is say, okay, what can you do with the existing charter, with the existing regulations that would make a huge difference to the world and which would simulate what the, the Fed is doing without needing to change the charter? So that's a technical aspect. Uh, you asked a very important question, the, the most important question. Uh, when the Dutch finance minister and all of, us, all of Schultz today, Schäuble before him, when they say no, no, no to euro bonds, to the Green New Deal, to all the things that are essential to prevent the disintegration of the European Union, why are they doing it? Don't they realize that it is in their interest to save the European Union? Of course they do. Of course they realize it's in their interest to save the European Union. but. Uh, if you look at the European Monetary Union, the Eurozone, it has achieved something that is unique in the history of capitalism. Uh, a triumph of the oligarchy that has never um, been emulated in the United States, in Britain, in Brazil. And what is a triumph? Look, suppose Bernie Sanders were to be elected president of the United States. Suppose you know, Jeremy Corbyn were to be elected Prime Minister in Britain, right? I mean, they came close. They were not that far. Uh, they would have instruments in their hands for shifting wealth from rich to poor. Yeah? They would have those instruments. In the Eurozone, nobody does. So if, if, you know, Angela Merkel does not have the instruments that are necessary to shift substantial amounts of wealth from rich to poor Germans. She just doesn't have them because she doesn't have access to monetary policy. Monetary policy is now being pursued independently by, the, by Frankfurt with that charter that you mentioned. Yeah? She has more degrees of freedom to do stuff than the Greek prime minister, than the Italian prime minister. But still, there are very, very limited degrees of freedom that the German chancellor has, whoever the German chancellor might be. I mean, even if we took Rosanna and made her Chancellor of Germany today, right? She would have very few levers to pull. That is a great triumph because, you see, the Eurozone has all the instruments for enriching the rich, for saving the bankers. Uh, we had all these programs. I mean, look at, you know, the, they, they've printed that. But now, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm counting the number. Since the 1st of March 2015, the European Central Bank has printed six and a half, six and a half trillion euros to give to the bankers. So the institutions are all in there, the instruments are all there to help the oligarchy. Not one instrument is there to enable any democratic elected politi politician anywhere in the European Union, not even the head of the commission. The head of the commission is completely powerless. Have no, has, the whole budget of the EU is 1% of GDP, of European GDP, and most of it is already given to the farmers, to the, the lobbies, to this, that, and the other. So no politician in Europe has the power to harm the oligarchy, right? Now, this is something that the oligarchy is not going to let go. And these people who are in power, they are all in power, in power, in government. They're not in power, they're in government. There's a very big difference, right? They're in government because they had 
a lot of support from the newspapers of the oligarchy, funding from the oligarchy, you know, pats on the back from the oligarchy. It's not, it's very difficult for them to turn against the oligarchy because they depend on them. They are prime ministers and finance ministers and so on because the oligarchy put them there. It's really very simple. So it's very difficult for the Dutch finance minister, for the German finance minister, when they have Siemens behind them, they have Volkswagen behind them, they have all those companies in Holland that feast off the tax havens. Right? It's, it's impossible for them, it would be political suicide to endorse the Eurobond. Because the Eurobond is an instrument that can be used to shift wealth. At least that's my answer. Yanis, anything to add or? Okay. So let's go back to Simona now. Oh, just quick, quickly. Um, I think in Lisbon, we discussed it about uh, independent workers, uh, David, you were there. Uh, but uh, so um, the issue of independent workers, uh, uh, job as a privilege, bullshit jobs, and uh, um, debt and shame of debt uh, are keys uh, to us, I think. Um, I think this is the uh, most important uh, issue on about which we should uh, fight uh, uh, all over Europe. Uh, uh, the situation you described uh, is this, uh, the same uh, in Italy. Uh, in demand, independent workers are, are, are starving now and uh, they have no way to pay the rents and uh, um, they have uh, they are obliged to uh, tap on uh, bullshit jobs and the, the um, narrative of uh, the existence of uh, jobs uh, where the, they aren't so um, Let's connect all over Europe to fight about it. And, uh, and to say <laughs> job, should, job is a privilege now and, uh, uh, and fuck austerity. Thank you, Simona. And now we go to Marta. Marta, the floor is yours. Yes, just as uh, some final comments and regarding the, the Green New Deal campaign, I think um, this pandemic is almost a cautionary tale when it comes to climate change. Because as with the latter, it was predicted by scientists for decades and the political institutions did nothing about this. And so we need to learn this lesson quickly. We need our governments to start acting instead of reacting. And science needs to have its voice heard when it comes to policy making. We need a plan to deal with what's to come because reacting might do regarding treating the pandemic itself, but surely will not suffice when it comes to climate change. Um, and uh, really to me, the Green New Deal is the most comprehensive plan out there to do this and to really redirect the economy and democratize the financial EU institutions. So, I think we should uh, really push this forward. Thank you, Marta. And as we are slowly coming to an end, I'm glad to ask if anyone has any closing comment. Let me say that it's, uh, it's true. We have a lot of work to do, but we have the will. We have the, our common program for Europe. We should, of course, work on it and enrich it. But I, I feel a great uh, positive energy and I'm really I'm certain that we we'll find, uh, we'll find all the time and all the goodwill to move it forward. So anyone else wants the floor for a closing comment? Just raise your hand or... Okay. And now we go to Eric. Eric? Sure. Just along the lines of what you said for Timi, you know, I don't think any one of us joined DM because what DM suggests to do is easy. Um, we joined DM because it felt like what DM was proposing is the right thing to do, right? And I think when we coordinate DM, whether we do it at the European level, whether we do it at the national level, whether we do it at the local level, 
we can't afford to cut any corners. Uh, our job is not to cut corners. Our, not, our job is not to find the quickest, easiest way to get things done. Our job is to remain true to what we felt when we first joined DiEM as the right thing, right? What that means, I think, is that we need to we need to always keep our eyes on what it is that we're trying to achieve, right? And if we do that, if we remain coherent everywhere in Europe, if what you guys are doing in Portugal also is coherent with what people are doing in Italy, we coordinate with each other well, we, we fight for the same things, then essentially we are offering Europe the only chance it has, a, a common united front to try and change it. If we deviate from that, we might be able to win shorter, short-term victories, but we lose the ability to achieve what we set out to do achieve in the beginning. So I think it's really important that we, we stay true to what the M25 is all about. Even though it feels like a long shot, it's at least an honest shot. And, and sometimes that's the most that anyone can hope for, you know, that we remain true to that honest shot that we're giving Europe. Um, so that, that's, that's it for me, my sort of closing remark, if you like. Thank you, Eric. And we go to Diego for his closing remark. Diego, the floor is Thank you. Uh, one, one last mention to something that I think lacked in some parts, it was mentioned briefly, which is the scientific scrutiny. One of the things that DM has been trying to do is that we actually apply the scientific scrutiny to all of that we do. For example, the Green New Deal is remarked with hundreds and uh, hundreds of articles, for example, and all of them are from renowned scientists and from uh, with exact references to where they can be found, where can you experiment these studies, where can you develop from them. And that's one of the things that politics nowadays is a bit lackluster of. For example, Jack Fresco used to say, the late Jack Fresco used to say a lot, for example, to build a road, there is a road that is imagined too many accidents, too many, uh, or too many, too many problems that road. And you go to local municipality and it like, they, they will spend like two weeks arguing, you go, let's make it of this. And then one of them as a construction company, they will try to fix the problem. The problem should, those kinds of problems should be addressed by a scientific community. We should listen to the scientists in both what COVID is related and what Green Deal is related. It shouldn't be a bunch of politic, politicians, sorry, this, don't say this in a bad way, but it shouldn't be the politicians defining the goals and sometimes pre pre presenting those proposals. The, the politicians that are good politicians listen to their scientists. And that's something that we're missing a lot in our day decision-making nowadays uh, process, both for Corona, both for Green Deal, both for <laughs> migration. Like we have studies in all of those, we should use them. We should use the people with expertise to solve those problems. Thank you. Thank you, Diogo. Thank you all for being here to participate in today's Beyond the Balcony session episode in Portugal. Thank you all, all those for being there and watching us live and Make sure not to miss the next one, the next Beyond the Balcony series episode. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye, everybody.